questions. I don't have my microphone on yet. Uh, 609. 609. <coughs> 609. Let's sing all three stand. <coughs> 609. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor to defend his cause. Maintain the honors of his word, the glory of his cross. Firm as his throne is promised and that he can well secure. War to me, till his hand, till of his eyes divide. Then will he own my worthless name be for his father's face, and in the near Jerusalem, a point for me, a place. Psalm 22, 22, if you haven't gotten there yet, and then we'll get back to Hebrews chapter 2. Psalm twenty two twenty two. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Under the Old Testament law, whether patriarchal or mosaic, how were the people able to praise God? I'm talking about emotions, but in what ways could they praise God? Okay, number one, they could do it through their offerings. Let me see right quick. I have a pass. Psalm 54, 6. Somebody would read. Psalm 54, verse 6. I will freely sacrifice unto thee. I will praise thy name, O Lord, for it is good. So one of the avenues by which people under the Old Testament law could praise God was through sacrifice. How else? Okay, number one, they could sing. Uh, most of the times the word praise is used, it's found in the book of Psalms, and there are numerous times that it combines the two that they would sing in their praise. How else? Okay, uh, that's the place, but I'm just talking about what, how would they praise God, not necessarily in what place they would do it, but that's correct. Keep the law? Uh, no, that's not really praising, no. Um, their obedience. Okay, obedience. Uh, think, think more from the standpoint as far as praise, as far as worship goes. All right. Uh, Let's see. Psalm 149 3. Psalm 149 3. And they praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praises of him with the temple and walk in the heart. So that combines a, a number of things, both as far as from this dance that's described here and also the temple and the heart. Uh, the main point, and here are a couple of other passages. First Chronicles 23.1 uh, says that with instruments they do it. And that's the main point that I'm trying to get out as far as whether it's with the dance or with the instrument, specifically with the dance, uh, with the instrument. Uh, from the standpoint that it is a statement that he gives here from Psalm 22.22 that is quoted in Hebrews chapter 2. One of the things that we may mention now was that there are times that the Holy Spirit 
as we see this quotation in Psalm 22, makes a change to it in the New Testament to some degree. And now, we're not allowed to change God's Word. The Holy Spirit, if it wants to change it in some form or fashion, does so from Psalm 22 to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 12. Think about Psalm 22 and then read Hebrews 2, verse 12. And what is the difference, if any? It makes the change that it's not just praise that he's talking about, but it's the matter of singing praise. Why would he not just quote it directly as it was? Or is there a significance from what the New Testament church does as far as worship in that we sing rather than dance, use a harp, use a timbrel, use cymbals, use instruments? Because there's no other New Testament passage that speaks about worship that includes the instrument of music as far as mechanical goes. It's one of the things God wanted to change from Old Testament worship. Right. That's why there's a difference. Yeah. I think there is that, at least me personally, I think that there is a big significance of why it's changed because the entire writer could have just put it down in Psalm 22 and all the Jews could have thought about it in Old Testament terms if they wanted to. Yeah. In both the cases, God was specific. Sure. Well, not necessarily under in Psalm 22 was he specific because he used that generic word praise and we saw how the all these different things under the Old Testament were used. Well, I'm talking about the instrument music. Right. Or the, the music. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just a, a side note. And uh, I want to, let's see. Right, let me find the next one before we move on. We're in Hebrews chapter 2 now. We'll go back to there again. Uh, the verse right before it. Uh, Hebrews 2.11. One reason I chose the Psalm 609, uh, here it makes a statement that Jesus is not ashamed to call them brethren. Isn't that something amazing? That by virtue of the fact that he took flesh and blood like us, became made like Abraham's seed, and he's not ashamed of us. If we are those that are not slipping away, if we are not those who are letting things drift, and if we are going to remain faithful as we get into chapter 3 about some of the comments, he's not ashamed of us. Are we, in turn, ever ashamed? Uh, Larry brought out Romans 1.16, Paul statement, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. So, that gives us a, a great deal of things to think about with the work of Jesus Christ. Through um, chapters 1 and 2. Yes, ma'am. No, I was just going to say about him not being ashamed of us. Even as we strive to live the Christian life, we still fumble and bumble mm -hmm. things, and he's still not ashamed. It, it's pretty amazing to me. And that is one reason, because he has faced those things. He became flesh and blood, and as we get to the end of chapter 2, it says that, you know, he is able then to comfort or to succor those, uh, to understand what we've gone through. And so it's important to see what a great sacrifice Jesus made. That he was hired, but became made a little lower than the angels, like us to face the things that we face and more than we face and to know what we've gone through. But it's all for us to deliver them who through fear of to comfort us. And so all of these things as chapter 2 concludes are all written from the standpoint of Jesus' great work for us. So let us never think that God does not care about us, does not want to help us, and does not want to save us eternally. 
Um, yes, ma'am. Terry, I just have a question. Okay. When, when you hear um, even a faithful Christian, well, you don't, those of us who really trust and understand, but maybe those that are Christians and they just cannot possibly understand why the persecution that they're experiencing in their life will it end? Why? I mean, why? It's hard for me to explain to somebody or to answer that question. Uh, I'm having a hard time. It's about Stuart. He just doesn't understand why it just keeps getting worse or it doesn't get better or and and it's. I don't know what I'm asking. Do you do you know what I'm? I'll try to explain. Renette's asking the question why it is. And she explains specifically from a from Stewart's standpoint of uh, things seemingly are, are so bad for him. Uh, why things in his life aren't going the way that he would like for them to be. Uh, we have to understand that as God's children, He's not going to remove us necessarily from facing difficult times. Difficult times can either make us stronger or they can weaken our faith. Uh, you read James chapter 1 and 1 Peter chapter 1, the trial of your faith being more precious than gold that perishes. Uh, it's how we respond to those things that we have to face. Uh, I think it was one of the therapists, uh, they had a, the sign up, no pain, no gain. Uh, from the standpoint physically, we understand that there has to be some resistance and there has to be those things that we have to work against in order to strengthen our physical body. Well, spiritually, God says the same thing is true. Uh, that if we do not face those difficulties, then how will we able to be able to use them to be strong? And God's not inflicting no, things I mean, upon us. I no, mean, I mean, that's in James chapter 1. Right? God can do no evil, neither tempt right. any man with evil. And from that standpoint, uh, Satan's busy enough, he, he's going to do all that he can in order to do that. Don't know if that helps from that standpoint. But even with Jesus' case, he didn't spare him. Jesus prayed that it could possibly, but it didn't. And so he still had to face those from the beginning of his ministry to the end of his ministry as well. All right. Chapter 2 concludes with giving us some insight how chapter 3, again, man has made the divisions. In verse 17, that Jesus might be a merciful and faithful high priest to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. So he's injecting already this thought about being a high priest, and that's what we move into in the beginning of chapter 3. But it's qualified. It's not just a priest. It's the high priest. And it's also a merciful and faithful high priest. Because you can go back through the Jewish history and you can find high priests, probably in the first century uh, as well. There were high priests who were just social and political ladder climbers. Uh, they didn't really care about the people. They just wanted to make sure that things were okay as they faced Rome or whatever situation they might have been in. But here Jesus is a faithful and a merciful high priest. Right, anything about chapter 2 as we conclude it and get into 3? Alright, chapter 3. How many times as we've already started this, is the writer emphasizing we are brethren? We're going through this together. We care about one another. The temptation and the obstacle for these individuals, go back to the Old Testament law to that which you were comfortable with, what you thought was better for you then. Don't continue to be persecuted, as Lynette was saying, under this new law of Christ. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers, not just brethren, but we have something in common. We are partakers of the heavenly calling. Consider. Consider the apostle and the high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ. 
Don't ever lose sight of heaven. Your brethren, but you also have that hope of heaven, partakers of that heavenly call. Then he says, consider. And we're getting into the section of where there's the contrast. We've studied chapters 1 and 2. Jesus was better than the angels. Now Jesus in chapter 3 is better than Moses. Now that's going to be a hard pill to swallow for the Jews who wanted to go back to Judaism, who felt comfortable under the law of Moses. But here's someone to consider. Now, we get into political elections and all of these individuals say, consider this one, consider this one, consider another. And what we do is we measure them up and we stack them together and we say, okay, which one is going to do the best job? There's nothing different here. Look at the two choices. You have Moses, you have Jesus Christ. But he begins already by saying, look how far ahead Jesus is. He, number one, is the apostle. Number two, he's that high priest. He is the one that we ought to consider. God's always allowed us to make our own choices. Sometimes to our own hurt. But he made us free will, so he says consider. And that is, you ought to look with earnest desire at this individual. <laughs> Scrutinize. Examine. Why is he called, first of all, the apostle? <clears throat> what is the meaning of apostle? Well, the meaning of apostle is one who is specially sent. Right. He is specially sent for a specific purpose. Okay. That's true. Jesus is an apostle. He is the apostle. Because he was sent by the Father. That's what we had taking place in chapter 2, wasn't it? Being made like unto his brethren, taking flesh and blood. He was sent to do that and then to make reconciliation for the people. How then is it? And again, we, we have to wait a little while before we really get into the high priest discussion as far as chapters 4 and following. But why is he called a high priest? He is that one who makes intercession and sacrifice, as Jim said, for the people. The high priest. If you think about it, this gets to the star of Jesus coming into the world and his return to heaven. He was sent, but he became our high priest when he went back. Consider him then. Who was faithful, verse 2? To him that appointed him. Uh, in, oh, there, you don't have to raise it higher. <laughs> it doesn't specifically spell it out in this chapter, but I think this is a good point to also <laughs> Point out that Christ is better than Moses because in the Exodus 32 32, Moses was pleading for the people and said, Let me take their place, block my name out. Right. You know those that have sinned against me. Well, now we get to Christ, and Christ is the one that can take the sins off of it. That's definitely true. Moses wasn't that perfect sacrifice, he, he had no ability through his life to become that. From what tribe, as we're discussing the Mosaic period, from what tribe did the priest and the high priest come? The tribe of Levi. From what tribe was Jesus from? Judah. Judah. So now we have a big distinction that will be carried on later on as we get into more about Melchizedek and others as far as the high priest is concerned. But here it makes the statement, there was somebody who appointed him to be this. They appointed him to be sent. They appointed him to become that high priest. 
And so we're already seeing a distinction between the old law and the new law and the change that's taking place. But we already see, second, Jesus again is faithful. Full of faith. He is the one who is perfectly going to keep this law and therefore qualify himself to be that high priest that we need. So in verse 2, Jesus is faithful. Moses was faithful in all his house. So we have two individuals, faithful, faithful. So we have to make a distinction. Three, verse 3, For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who buildeth the house hath more honor than the house itself. I added itself. Than the house. And that's an easy concept, isn't it? Which shows more authority, more ability, uh, the one who built the house or the house. That's an easy concept. The house is just an inanimate object. There had to be intellect and thinking and reason and planning to get to the process of building the house. So the contrast now we have or the comparison we have both being faithful, but now the comparison begins to be seen. Every house, verse 4, is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were spoken after. Moses was doing his job. He sinned at times. But when we look at his overall life, he was faithful. Here's the big contrast. Moses was faithful as a servant. Moses barely was Faithful in all the house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were spoken at. So when you look at comparisons, uh, one of the best works probably for the church is Brother Gaddis Roy's books on types and antitypes. Uh, he makes this comparison because here the same thing is said. Moses served as a picture. Something to be looked at as far as his faithfulness and compared to Jesus Christ. Verse 6, But Christ as a son over his own house. This sort of reasoning Paul uses in Galatians chapter 4 uh, about the son and the servant and which one is better off. Same thing here. You have Moses as a servant. You have Jesus Christ as a son. Back up just a moment. We have four terms that are used. We have apostle, high priest, Christ, and Jesus. All of those terms speak volumes about this one who is now son over his own house. Moses a servant in a house. Jesus has a son over the house. Whose house are we? 1 Timothy 3.15, what is the house of God? The church is. The church is the house of God. Now, we understand that people can have more than one house. If they're well enough off, they may have a vacation home here, there, whatever the case may be. Most of us, we have one house, and that's it. But he's making the distinction between that house that Moses was in, 
which even in Acts chapter 7 is called the church in the wilderness, maybe chapter 13. But in either case, there is another house over which Jesus is. And that is the one described here. If we hold fast the confidence, the qualification on we are that house, if we hold fast, there's warning after warning after warning in this book. You cannot turn away. You can't go back. Don't give up on following Christ. He is that faithful and merciful high priest that if we want to go to heaven, his blood has to cover our sins. So we have to hold fast. And in that he says there is the rejoicing of the hope firm. It's not just an easygoing confidence. It's not just a little bit of hope. It is a hope that is firm. That means that we can have a foundation that rests assured. I think it's the second stanza that, that begins in that song 609. Firm as his eternal law. So we must be those that aren't going to go back. That aren't going to give up. Now we get into the part that really contains this warning. Any comments about it? Down to verse 6. All right. The verse 7 begins, Wherefore, as the Holy Spirit said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. In the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. What better way, as he's already done in chapters 1 and 2, and to draw on their own history and their own scriptures. And I say own scriptures from the standpoint that which was given to them. It is inspired. The Holy Spirit says, Today, how many of us procrastinate? <laughs> Do I need to answer that? I can raise my other arm up way up behind and do it too. We all procrastinate in areas. Some of them they don't matter about putting things off till tomorrow. But here spiritually he says there is a great need of understanding. It's today. That's all that we have is right now. So we need to make our decisions either to hold firm unto the end or we need to understand the consequences. Here's the illustration. Are you going to harden your hearts? Are you going to be like those in the wilderness? Are you going to be aware of what God has done as these 40 years describe them? And you turn away? Are you going to stop listening? Are you going to be putting off? What we need to know, he says here that they tempted God. They did so through Moses, didn't they? Forty years. Imagine the hardness of these people. That they have been brought up out of Egypt, freed from that bondage, and yet they continue through those 40 years murmur and complain and at times rebel against God's authority over and over. 40 years. For us, that's pretty much a wasted life, isn't it? It was for them. The generation would die. Here's the consequence, verse 10. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart. They have not known my ways. But it wasn't it responsibility from the king, at least on down, 
that the king read the book of the law? So what does he mean that they did not know? They didn't want to know. They weren't going to follow it. You ever told somebody something to you were blue in the face and they still didn't want to listen? You're talking to the wall. Talking to a wall. No wonder they're called stiff necked and uncircumcised and hard in various places. Now they just bowed up their back against God and said, We're not going to do it. It wasn't that the word wasn't presented to them, but they could not have known. Deuteronomy 6 describes the family situation that you teach your children at all times. Sit down, lie down, eat, walk in the way. So it wasn't that they did not have the potential to know. They chose not to know. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 1 7. Do we pick up today? God is grieved over the fact that these people continue to make mistakes. When those people came to Jesus and asked about the Levirate marriage of Husband dies, and brother marries the wife, on down through seven of them. Jesus said, you do err not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. It moves from grief. You know, it seemed like they were understood. They clothed and locked, shoes and wore out. They were provided with food. Uh, everything was there for them. Well, that's where you get into that statement here. Uh, they saw it as it worked 40 years. Uh, and they still just didn't do it. So we move from grief in verse 10. I swear in my wrath. Verse 11. They shall not enter into my rest. That rest was the promised land that he had offered to them if they faithfully followed, but that generation did not hear, so they would not be blessed either. The lesson for us, with that illustration of, from the Old Testament, verse 12, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Now, we see from news, uh, and we see individuals, uh, and they may kill someone. It may be that they kill a number of people. And we start parsing words, is that person evil or not? Call somebody evil doesn't mean they're crazy or not in control of their actions. Here God says, when you do not listen to my word, and you do not follow it, there's an evil heart of unbelief. That unbelief necessarily produces. Now, the evil heart produces the unbelief. Do not allow that to happen. That's the warning. Take heed. Consider, as the chapter begins, Jesus Christ. But now you need to take heed. What's been taught, what's been said, don't make the same mistakes as those others. What happens? You depart from the living God. How does chapter 2 begin? Lest it slip away. We think something slipping away is accidental, but it's produced because we didn't take the right action. Now he says, you depart. I have no idea how anyone in their right mind could come up with once saved, always saved. Unless they want to convince themselves, I can live like I want to and still go to heaven. When they read this passage, in departing from the living God, these individuals, both in the illustration, were Jews. They were God's children. And now he says, we are his house, the church. And he says, you can depart. And 
let me ask you something, Terry. Yeah. When you say that they, uh, when they believe this, they feel like they can live like they want to. Do some like consciously think that way? Oh, there, there are writings and debates that somebody will defend the point. If that person dies in the act of sin, they'll go to heaven. So even though it's so willful and yeah. conscious. So are they even taught to try not to sin? I mean, if they 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 answer the question, we will try to, to live the best life. But it, it is still the other way around. Terry, I've heard this show actually argue with Al Wick. I discussed it in my But I got all the way to the Detroit and back about the same issue. And he continued to go to all the verses about predestination, etc. He, he believes in predestination and what Satan always say about that. An extra layer of pain. But he said that, that he had examples even of, of say, a preacher that they knew was a, a good guy and, and did all the things he was supposed to do, and then he turns up that he's in an adulterous relationship. And then he gets cancer and dies. He says, well, that's what happens. You get punished, but that doesn't keep him out of heaven. But there's no in the scripture that says that. Right. And, and it's so indefensible that it's just ridiculous. And unfortunately, so many people believe it. And that's what actually prompted my dad to become a Christian. He was raised Presbyterian and got about 16 and said, you know, I'm either saved or I'm not. Why am I to go on Sunday morning? Right. Yeah. So he quit going and then he started studying the Bible on his own. And that would be the end result. I mean, you might not do anything. I think that's addressed in the Old Testament, too. It says if you are uh, doing evil deeds, then you repent. And start to do good, God will tell that it's righteous. Sure. But the same thing is when you continue God, if you are uh, doing righteous deeds, but then you turn and, and do evil, you will not uh, count that as, as righteousness anymore because you have turned away from doing righteous deeds. And the same thing in Romans 6 1 and 2, Paul makes it clear that I will continue on sin, that grace may be at the He says, heaven is pretty much what God did. And those are good points, but all the way back to patriarchal age, it was, you know, you obey God and you're blessed, you disobey and the other way. So it moves, as Frederick was saying, all the way through the scriptures. Take heed, verse 13, exhort one another daily. We're brethren, holy brethren, the chapter begins. Family ought to be concerned about one another. It's not the only time that we'll find the word exhort as we go through, but he says, exhort one another daily while it is called today. Lest here is a statement again, uh, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. It's tricky. It's beguiling. Uh, it wants to deceive us. So we need to have that exhortation. 14, he comes back to the concept, for we are made partakers. We're partakers of the heavenly calling. Now we are made partakers of Christ. If we hold, give heed, hold, don't let it slip away, do not depart. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Now he's always emphasizing this today, but now he says there's the end out there somewhere. We've got to start at the beginning, and however long it takes to get to the end, be steadfast, unmovable. Don't give up and don't stop. Keep going until the end. 15, while it is said, today, if you will hear his voice. Paragraph began that way, the Holy Spirit said, these things, listen. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. Learn from the mistakes of others. The Old Testament was written for our learning. Learn from their mistakes. Harden not your hearts. For some, verse 16, when they had heard, did provoke. That is, they 
still wanted to turn against, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that sinned? They're the ones whose heart was hardened. They're the ones who tempted, wanted to prove God. To those individuals, God was grieved, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness. You remember how many men were counted under the census as they left Egypt? 603,550. I don't know what the largest cemetery is, but imagine as they marched for those 40 years, the graves, the carcasses fell in the woods, all because they said, we can't go up and take the land. We're not going to follow God's authority. God was displeased. Last verse. And to whom swear he that they should. Last two verses. Should not enter into that rest. But to them that believe not. The evil heart of unbelief. Now it's just qualified. They believe not. So we see that they could not enter into that rest. Because of unbelief. Will we allow that? To keep us from going to heaven? Chapter 4 is going to emphasize that greatly. As Larry will show on Sunday. Any comments as we close? Yes. It's just those so sad to read that about the consciousness falling in the wilderness. That those people have been saved. And they are already on the path to their new home. That's right. Exodus chapter 15. Exodus 15 says that when they crossed the Red Sea, they sang the song of deliverance. They were free. A really good point in the past. All right. Pick up on chapter 4. <laughs>
16. That will be the song of encouragement at the end of the lesson. If you would mark that. And go 300 pages to your right, 916. 916. <laughs> there is coming a day when the no more clouds in the sky, no more tears in the All is saved us by his grace, the one whom we'll see one day in that face-to-face. -face. What a glorious day. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. If we were paying attention through Hebrews chapter 3, we'll see something similar in, he, in, in 2 Corinthians 6. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that receive not the grace of God in vain. For he said, I have heard thee in a time accepted, 
And in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Today, now, this is the time that we have. God doesn't want us to put off doing what we know we need to do. Now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. If you are outside of Christ and therefore to come, would that be a glorious day as we finished thinking about a while ago? Or would it be a day that we hear not Jesus taking us by the hand, but depart from me, ye that work iniquity, for I never knew you. If you're outside of Christ, our Lord invites you to be one that is comforted by Him and knowing your sins have been forgiven. That forgiveness comes when we obey the gospel, 1 Peter 4, verse 17. It is through faith that we obey Jesus, John 8, 24. It is by the repentance of our sins that we obey Jesus, Luke 13, 3. It is with confession of Jesus as the Son of God that we obey Him, Matthew 10, 32. To then be immersed, baptized in water, Acts 2, 38, for the remission of our sins. To obey Him. But Paul is encouraging those in this passage to not give up and stop. We think about that glorious day and all the things that said won't be there anymore. That ought to motivate us to want to go to heaven. Are we living faithfully to God? Or have we started putting off doing it? Being faithful to people. It's a night you're unfaithful. In repentance of those sins, confession, we can pray for your forgiveness. God forgives. If this evening you're subject to our Lord's invitation, please come. We stand and sing. I must be going home by the way of the cross. There's no other way I'm going to inside of the Thank you. 
first and second Timothy, Titus and Philemon, Hebrews, James, first and second Peter, first and second and third John, Jude and Revelation. We had a great Bible class. Mentioned as we began our adult class, but Jason was here. Lisa's also feeling well enough to be out tonight, and it's great that God has blessed them with enough health to do that. Amen. Teresa is feeling better. Uh, somebody's well, wife is still not. Okay. The little one's running a fever, so Christina and Willow are at home. Uh, still, we definitely want to keep the moodiness in our prayers as Kevin continues to see uh, various doctors. Uh, Chris May made a trip to the emergency room to take, try and take care of a migraine. Uh, still have all of those others, and uh, the list seems to get a little bit longer. Richard doesn't ever keep the Richards in the family. Richard went to the doctor today, and he's doing better, but he has to be in a wheelchair for another month, please. Okay. Uh, report update on uh, Richard. Uh, went to the doctor, and he's still improving some, but he's still going to be in the wheelchair for at least the upcoming month. So a lot of folks we need to be thinking about. Area-wide singing, March the 6th, uh, sign up list uh, is on the board. Uh, please take time to go by it and look and see if there's something you can volunteer for. And then uh, March the 14th will be our ladies' day. And so we'll need some men to volunteer to, I think it'll be fairly easy as far as that goes to get things ready. Uh, so need a number of men to get things ready that morning as far as the ladies' day. Uh, lunch will be concerned, so uh, let myself know or Larry, and we'll be glad to have you come. Uh, Jeremy, Dave has our, oh, also mentioned uh, best father uh, is in the hospital over in Atlanta, Tim Crowley, so let's remember him also. Jeremy has our closing prayer, so we would understand we'll be dismissed in prayer. Jeremy, Jeremy, thank you so much for this week that you today. For every day that we have to live with her. Thank you so much for creating us, but also for creating us to worship you and to be with you. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ and for his willingness as we saw in Hebrews to come down and to suffer here, to live life as a man, and to take on our sin, though he had not on the cross. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to be able to spend eternity praising you. Father, we ask now a special prayer for all those mentioned that are ill and sick and recuperating. And Father, we know there's so many on the list and others that we don't even know about. We ask that you would put your hand on them, that each of those might be healed and might be back with us if it's your will. Father, especially for those that are caretaking them at this time, the doctors and nurses and also the family, so that they would have strength and be able to be a comfort to them. And Father, if there's anything that we could do, that we might be a comfort as well. Father, we ask that you would help us as we go into the world that we might be spiritually recharged from this evening, from the edification and the fellowship, and from learning your word, that we might go out and combat evil, and that we might always be good examples of how to live life the way that you require us to live. Father, we ask that you would forgive us of any sin that stands between us and me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.